David McGinley with the Healing Cancer Foundation, and welcome to today's podcast. And um, I wonder if you've ever wondered if you have too much on your plate, you might really get a lot from this podcast. We're going to be interviewing someone who is, by definition of what most people might say, is an overachiever. Imagine being a top executive, being in a successful and very busy uh, career in the telecommunications industry, being a mom, uh, living a fantastic life, and um, on top of being the, uh, the, the go-getter executive and, and the overachiever, being diagnosed not only with cancer, but actually ended up being diagnosed with multiple terminal conditions and overcoming all of them. Having this ripple out through your life to change perspective, priorities, and actually to amplify your life and deepen your engagement with it in ways you never could have conceived. Uh, we're going to be talking with Kathy McLaughlin, and I'm really uh, excited and looking forward to this conversation. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you, David. Thanks very much for the kind introduction. That makes it sound very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it will be from, from what I've read and from what we've been chatting about. Uh, now, I'm here uh, recording from Halifax, Nova Scotia, and Kathy's on the other end of the uh, country and in uh, Vancouver, I think. Yes, and I'm um, glad that we can connect through, uh, through this technology. So not only um, uh, surviving these multiple conditions, you're also uh, a successful author. You published a fantastic book called Back to Life, One Woman's Inspiring Triumph Over a Series terminal diagnosis and that's been, that's available on Amazon and chapters and we'll talk a bit about that but uh, well it's the journey in the story yeah so when did this all start what how 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 many years ago and how were you, how how were you diagnosed well I'm almost 60 so I'll admit that now right out of the gate and it started when I was just turned 40 that was my first diagnosis with Hodgkin's lymphoma and my kids were very young at that point. I was a, a senior VP with a company called Rogers Communications here in, uh, based in Vancouver. Actually, they're based in Toronto, but I had a, a Vancouver-based role. And um, I found out I had, I had cancer. And so I went through treatment for that. It was a four-month round of chemotherapy, and I took my chemotherapy on Friday so I could uh, recover over the weekend and get right back to work on Monday. And after four months, uh, I was declared cancer-free and moved on with my life. So that was stage one. That was phase one. <laughs> Let's pause for a moment there. You said diagnose Friday and then do what on Monday? Oh, no, I, I would have my chemo on oh, Friday. Monday. Yeah. And so I could recover on the weekend. On the weekend. And then I to work on Monday. And now, of course, that's not what most people experience. You have uh, either particular resilience. Uh, first round of chemo sometimes is is uh, smoother sailing than they, they anticipate. But there you were, going back to work on Monday. How do you recall how that felt, having gone through your first yeah, your 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 chemotherapy? Well, the steroids helped, <laughs> but. but um, it was cumulative, so there were certainly Mondays towards the end of the eight cycles that I couldn't get to work on time and didn't go and stayed, went on Tuesday. But for the most part, I, I'd given myself permission to, you know, call in sick if it got to that point. Uh, but I was, I am, and always have been pretty driven, so I was really focused on making sure that it didn't, you know, give me a career setback or cause concerns for the people I worked with. Did you share it with them right away? I did, actually. That was something I wanted. I, I've always been very open about the fact that I'm working on an illness and I, you know, I'm dealing with other things in my life because to me that was pretty important. Um, and so I did call a meeting at the very beginning and say this is what is happening. As soon as I knew what the diagnosis was. Yeah. Hmm. And when you received that diagnosis, do you recall how that felt? Yeah, at the time, I was uh, quite um, indignantly affronted by the fact that I, of all people, you know, one of the healthiest people I know and very sort of go-getter, very fit, would actually be sick. And so I, I didn't believe them initially until we got the, the full diagnosis. And then I guess I had to admit to myself that people like me could also get cancer. So it was hard. 
Now, when you say very fit, are you, you of course, I, I believe were running at the time. Yeah, yeah, I run, and, and you know, we'll get in a minute to the second diagnosis, because that was much more of a big affront, uh, and one that I couldn't ignore, but um, I've always been somebody who attends to my fitness and my diet and all those good things, and so um, when I got cancer, I realized there was probably more to the story because I guess fundamentally, somehow or another, I'm wired to believe that there's a message in your illness. And for me, at that time, at the age of 40, being a bit of a, let's say, let's say a, a workaholic, um, the message for me was pay attention to some other parts of your life as opposed to just work and just, I guess what I would call fairly extreme attention to fitness, but not health, you know, the holistic health. So yes, that, that's a shift from uh, feeling fit and being able to, you know, run half a marathon or, or not get winded, and health, including mind, body, spirit, uh, everything that encompasses the dimension of your personhood. Yes, exactly. Yeah, the four months of chemotherapy gave me lots of time to reflect. I enjoyed my Fridays, believe it or not, sitting in the chemo ward with all the other people that were going through something similar because it got me right back in touch with my own humanity and other people's situations. And I got to do some great reading on on getting back in touch with my spiritual orientation and just life balance in general. Um, can you say a bit more about that? Like, can you take yourself back to sitting in the chemo chair and seeing the other patients and reflecting on, yeah. on that, that aspect of meaning? Yeah, well, Two, two things come to mind when you ask me about that. One is just the books I was reading would cause conversations. And my first book, my go-to book, um, was uh, Love, Medicine, and Miracles by Dr. Bernie Siegel. Um, to me, that is the Bible for anybody who's been diagnosed. And it talked about um, a whole bunch of things, but the origins of disease and you know what message you should be, maybe think about taking from your cancer. And then I would um, start to have conversations with people around me. So there were you know, just really looking at and admiring what people were going through, how their family members responded, and it just touched my heart. I mean, it was really engaging. Something I hadn't spent a lot of time doing, which is just having normal human conversations with people that weren't about work or family or school or, you know, all those things that busy young mothers do. So here was cancer realigning you to your own life. Um, you you were encountering, experiencing, and exploring different aspects of yourself that you weren't uh, probably weren't used to as much, or put, putting that attention to it. Yeah. yeah, this this is how people forge meaning out of the experience, and it requires that vulnerability and awareness. Hmm. <laughs> so this is, I think, how the experience makes people forge meaning out of life. <laughs> like it's actually a two way thing, right? Because I didn't say, oh, now because I have cancer, I'm gonna forge some meaning out of being ill. Of course that is the first thought, but it was more like, it made me stop. You know, it made me slow down. I had to sit in a chair for, you know, four or five hours while I was receiving the medicine. And um, that was, I hadn't given myself the luxury of that kind of, um, you know, pause in, in life for a long time. And the treatment, uh, you, you proceeded through the treatment and then were given the all clear that you were in remission, you held remission, things look good? Yeah, they did. They, they look great. I, I was, um, the fortunate thing for me was I did recognize early on before I was diagnosed the first time the, the signs of being under extraordinary stress. The job I had had been um, really, really high pressure for a whole variety of reasons, which are actually in my book. Um, but it, to me, the way I responded to being in a very competitive um, in environment, corporate environment, um, made it toxic for me. I'm not saying the work environment was that way for everyone, but the way I responded to it meant I was under constant stress. I was living on adrenaline and I was uh, recognizing this in myself and some of the signs, the major signs of stress, like I was having anxiety attacks. Okay, hello. Um, and so I'd already secured another job. So when I came back from, from cancer, I was able to actually uh, work with a different company that I'd been approached and had searched out and um, 
it, it was a much better place for me. So, it, you know, through the process of, uh, of treatment, I, I guess, validated that decision. So um, you, you moved from Rogers Communication and uh, fairly high level, uh, high pressure to something that was more people oriented. Correct. Yeah. And well, it was a business. It was in telecommunications, um, and, but it was a competitor and it was actually, uh, they'd been set up on sort of a, a set of values that were very aligned with my own personal beliefs and values. So that's the research I had done. I, I you know, I, the, the job I was doing itself was not the problem. I think for me, it was the alignment with the people around me and how they behaved and what kind of a com corporate culture they had. And so that was, that was a learning. So that's, that's signs of stress that you mentioned. Uh, usually those include, uh, in addition to the anxiety, there can be, uh, you know, lack of sleep, irritability, poor digestion, uh, maladaptive coping strategies. Uh, yeah, all of the above, yes. <laughs> even exercise, even exercise. Uh, and exercise lets either let go of it, which just is a vicious circle, or some people move to the extreme athlete version. I, I swing back and forth between these. Um, when I, the second diagnosis, which I know you can ask me about, I was actually running back and forth to work three times a week because I'd actually changed jobs again and got myself back into a treadmill situation where I wasn't responding well to the environment. So. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Exhausting, right? It is. It, it's hard to, it, it's very difficult to imagine. I mean, just that one thing, running back and forth from work uh, in, in, instead of driving or, or taking public transit. Um, and then on top of everything else, but this was a, led to a growing self-awareness, a yes. uh, grow, growing choice for authenticity and a better work environment. And things proceeded along for how how long before new diagnosis. So that's the real irony for me is it was actually seven years. So by the time seven years rolls around, you have every right to believe that you're not going to be diagnosed with something else, right? Uh, or a recurrence of the same thing. So I was barreling along at full speed. I had changed from my role at Fido to move into um, executive search and I was a partner with a very large executive search firm. Um, and for me, again, I was back into a, sort of more of a competitive environment, which I respond to by redoubling my efforts and taking on more and more and more until I can be sort of running with the pack. Um, that's a good analogy. <laughs> the running thing here. <laughs> you we're back on the treadmill. I'm back on the treadmill. I was in, in spades, and I was actually enjoying the work. Work was eating me alive because I was putting in way too many hours. You know, I in, instead of relaxing or you know putting time into my health, I was, as they say, taking the fringes of the day and using them to run, <laughs> and uh, and just sort of ignoring my uh, my spiritual and emotional health. Um, you know, I was attending to the demands of family life, and so I felt like I wasn't shortchanging my family, but by doing that, I was, I think, shortchanging myself. And that time, I didn't even know I was sick when I was diagnosed. It came as kind of a, you know, a complete surprise uh, out of nowhere. This, this was the relapse? Yes. Uh, so... The, the original symptoms, didn't uh, you didn't notice them for the second time around? No, and that, that was ironic because I was in stage three uh, Hodgkin's again. But what happened was, um, I guess partly because I was running so much, my, my big toenails fell off. And they had been doing this since I'd had chemo. And so I, I thought maybe I had a fungus or something. It was probably just the running shoes. But um, I went to the GP and said, you know, let's fix this. It, you know, I was a little bit vain and I wanted to make sure my feet looked great in sandals for the summer. And so he said, well, there's a medicine you can take if it is that fungus and you have to, uh, before you take it, you have to go for a blood test uh, to make sure that, you know, your internal organs are intact and there's not going to be any issues. Um, and then when they got blood test results back, that's when they discovered I had all kinds of stuff going wrong. Um, my liver enzymes were eight times normal. And it took four months at that point of diagnostics and testing to, for them to figure out what was going on. And so it was true that I had a recurrence of Hodgkin's lymphoma, stage three, 
But at the same time, they discovered an autoimmune liver disease that was of unknown origin, possibly viral, but it had been going on in my system for 20 years, so it predated the original cancer. Oh. Yeah, because it was that long, I was at uh, liver failure end stage cirrhosis of the liver. That, that was a, a whammy. <laughs> you, you're in stage three cancer, uh, Hodgkin, not Hodgkin's or, or uh, lymphoma. You're uh, having liver failure. Yes. Your toenails are falling off. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And then. Well, of course, you're rushed into treatment once again. This I was. Well, by the time they diagnosed me, I was already, I was actually in the hospital. So it was really funny because I'd gone from really being fit, you know, running regularly, best, you know, body mass index of my life and, you know, on top of my game at work and everything else. And then, you know, the toenail thing with the GP, which I laughed at, and he, you know, when they said the blood tests are normal, I said, yeah, you probably got somebody else's. That would make no sense at all. But then by the, the, then they had to do all these tests, like very invasive procedures, biopsy, surgery, this and that, to figure out what was going on. And, and that destroyed kind of the equilibrium that I somehow mm -hmm. set up. And by the end of the four months of diagnosis, I was in the hospital completely jaundiced, like a swollen belly. I was actually in incredibly bad shape, near death, I guess I would call it. And that's when my GP came in and said, oh, so I guess you know what's going on. And I hadn't had any idea because I'd had two different specialists trying to figure it all out. And he told me the whole story. And so I was really sick at that point and still fairly incredulous that I sort of thought maybe it was all the, <laughs> all the testing that had made me sick, not really that I could possibly have two potentially fatal illnesses. So uh, uh, interesting to notice, cognitive dissonance. Uh, yeah doesn't go away uh, you, you can be re, you know get the second diagnosed relapse um, and still find yourself incredulous to to this new reality and pushing it back as much as you can so that you know these are the ways that we adapt to life-threatening situations yeah. um, you're in the hospital you're jaundice uh, those um, bad energy you put in to your spirituality, your your personal development and self awareness uh, that happened after your first cancer, did they kick in again, or did you have to recreate? The well, reason? I guess the, the come up for me was I sort of thought they'd never kicked out, you know, because I'd been continuing some of my practices, some meditation, some general um, attention, but I guess. They did, right? Uh, I let myself be dominated again by work drive and overdrive instead of a balanced approach to things. And so that's, for me, that was the, the major comeuppance was, I know I can actually do something about this. And I know this is a message for me to take about dealing with my uh, psycho-spiritual, emotional, and physical health. But I realized it was deeper than, than I let it that I allowed that it was the first time, that there was more to it. I had to explore deeper. I had to go to another level in terms of my spiritual alignment and what I really was here for. How, how did you do that? Well, a whole bunch of things. Um, I guess uh, I read a lot more about, you know, how Inspire Health is one of my sort of mentoring organizations here in Vancouver. They, ha they uh, deal with people who are at end stage uh, terminal diagnoses and they have a list of 11 principles that people who survive or have miraculous recoveries um, the attributes of those people and I went to school on every last one of them I mean the basics are um, taking control of your situation uh, some of the others are really getting back in touch with your core spirituality and what it is you believe in practicing it um, mind body work you know it's really on all three levels mind body and spirit so there's a list of things under each of those areas that i tackled meditation and visualization for me were absolutely job one um everything else kind of was secondary to that so a lot of people are intimidated by that work meditation um when it is a surprisingly simple yet difficult uh yes. Dis discipline to, to practice and so essential not only to your healing 
but in order, of course, for you to experience your life, to show up in your own life. For sure. Very yeah. few of us take that time to sit quietly and encounter ourself. Now, again, you're on treatment or you're in the hospital, and uh, it can be very boring. It can be a great opportunity for you to sit and meditate. Yeah, it, it was. It wasn't boring for any minute of that last, you know, the, the second diagnosis and the whole history after that because I was in crisis a lot of the time where the meditation and mind over matter or visualization came came in was actually under pain management and and getting some sleep in the hospital and those types of things so to me it was it was so much more important than it had been before can you walk us through a bit of how you might use that for pain management well I was I got um, so I was in a lot of pain for a variety of different reasons to do with whatever procedure I was undergoing, even after the diagnosis, we were back and forth with trying to figure out treatment and, and so on. And um, I, I mean, I would just, the painkillers weren't working. Um, and so I would just get myself into a meditative state, just the basics of deep relaxation, you know, the things anybody can practice. But to me, I would, I would, I would be just doing it. Um, to a point where I was actually in a trance. And so I could tolerate what, what was happening around me. But the trance was about visualizing as well, like visualizing healing myself as opposed to being subjected to or subject to just the medical system. Often in uh, meditation or mindfulness, the, the best thing is to focus on a dominant aspect of your experience, even if that is pain or mm -hmm. something unpleasant. It is part of the reality of what is here. Yeah. And so you focus upon what might be normally an irritant or even a torment. And through your compassionate presence, did you find you shifted your relationship to your pain? You you, you went to, a, you used that word trance, you got into a zone. Um, so that's an interesting question, David, because one of the lessons I believe that I've been taught through this whole process is, is dealing with anger. And so anger was, I mean, I actually firmly believe that the the disease you receive, if you will, um, has a message for you that's directly relevant to the disease you got. And so for me, I looked up a lot of, you know, maybe woo-woo for some people, but what is lymphoma? What is liver disease? What is that about? It's a systemic lymphatic system thing. And a lot of books say it's about dealing with anger. And so pain became the target of my anger as opposed to you know turning it on myself or turning it on others which is what happens when you're under stress you as you say you become dysfunctional and you can be an angry person i i was only angry at my pain so you were able to use your anger in a, a positive way it had so much energy you were able to put it to use instead of projecting it onto a person or projecting it to yourself yes yeah, that's what I tried to do anyway. It was a conscious thought. It was more, you know, I can, I can be, I can beat this. Um, but I also recognize that beating cancer isn't about fighting. I mean, you can fight the pain, but when it comes to the disease itself, and in fact, you know, liver disease was no different. I had to make peace with that. I had to make it my friend. I had to surrender to. The message that was coming with the disease and make it into a, a force for good and that that's the hardest thing to do I, I had conversations with people in the hospital where i said well i've surrendered to my disease said, oh my god don't do that you know that means and, and I, I said no i have i've surrendered to the possibility of even it you know overpowering me and me dying but i've had to do that in order to breathe into it like childbirth for me yes the, uh, the, the the it's a delicate but very significant um nuance to to explore how a disease contains its own wisdom mm -hmm. and is speaking to you about your life uh that doesn't deny the external factors that contributes to its cause mm -hmm. uh, but it also doesn't suppress the part the partnership you have in creating your own life yeah. Yeah. That's how I look at it. Stress and sort of suppressing it, say, your core 
spirituality, yeah. values, or fundamentals. Those two things combined create conditions so you're susceptible for disease that may also have to do with external other factors. Environment, you know, a number of the people that worked in telecommunications were diagnosed with cancer, and who knows, maybe it was because we were hanging out with, I shouldn't say this, probably get, <laughs> but you know. Yeah, that big question of why did I get this disease, you know, where it, can, it can rarely be answered, but what are you going to do with it? Yeah. It sounds like you got down to work. Yeah, that was exactly, so I turned, instead of, you know, focusing on work, work, I worked on myself. I turned my kind of corporate um, project management skills onto me, <laughs> my disease, working with the medical system, kind of taking control of being the project lead and having my, the Inspire Health team and then my medical team and my friends and loved ones and everybody kind of mobilized in the same direction. We're going to fix this. We're going to beat this, you know. Pathological optimism is kind of what they they labeled it as. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if you're going to be diagnosed with uh, any mental condition, that sounds like a great one, pathological yeah. optimism. Inspire Health has, um, yeah, you, you can go to their website and, and look at those positive aspects of remarkable survivors, and these are also listed in several books, uh, and they really are... Um, not entirely surprising when you read them, but when you do some self-reflection, you realize most of us do not engage with life with, no. uh, with, with these perspectives. Strong yes. connection to other people, yes. optimism, full participation in your condition and your treatment, yes. uh, a sense of purpose and value in life. Uh, and for many, uh, it requires a renewal or um, a transformation or a, a deepening of their spiritual principles, sense of meaning, sense of connection to God or something vaster than you. Uh, really, I think underlying them is all the activation of the power of love. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. so. Thanks now, for here you are with liver fail failure, a liver disease, and the cancer. What do you put first? How did, how did they proceed? That was why the diagnosis was so difficult even after we knew what they were in terms of how to treat. So, because... Um, and there was the double whammy. I mean, I was basically told that because I had end-stage cirrhosis of the liver, my body would not tolerate the chemo, aggressive chemo that was required to deal with the Hodgkin's lymphoma. And then the oncologist gave me the final sort of answer, which was, um, you can't, so you can't have chemo, but you need a liver transplant. And then the gastroenterologist said, you're not eligible for a liver transplant because you have cancer. So it was this double whammy, right? Um, and that's when we had to, I had to be the pathological optimist to say, we're going to find a way through this and encourage the two different specialists who weren't really working together to work on some other way. Um, and it's, I actually, I have a, a sense of pride, I guess, in, in well after the fact, when I run into my oncologist now, he always says to me, you know, it was, it was all you. It was, and he points to my head and he says, it's all you because they were, they'd given up. They just didn't have any answers for me. Finally, they found, they um, discovered, um, well, a very kind doctor who also says, a gastroenterologist, he says he was responding to the fact that I was so positive we would figure it out. He went home on his own time, read my whole file, and scoured the internet for any kind of clues as to the combination of illnesses. And he came up with something he thought was workable. And then he referred me to a hepatologists who could actually um, make the final decision and and so they found a way of treating the liver first so that it would then tolerate chemo to some extent that was another long story but we did we got through it <laughs> right it's a happy <laughs> well we got through not quite as simple as that but we got through it uh so just a reminder we're, we're it's the healing cancer foundation podcast we're talking with kathy mclaughlin and we are just at the point where a person with recurrent lymphoma is going to get a liver transplant. So that that comes up. This is right. before the chemo was given. No, it was after. So I had so that made it even more difficult because I had to survive this experimental chemo. It had to actually be successful. And then I had to be in remission for another four to five years to be eligible for a transplant. And so they had shored up the liver so it could tolerate the chemo to the point that it was 
functioning, which was good news because that meant it wasn't like in failure. Um, I tolerated the chemo over the course of a whole year. And then at the end of that year, I was declared cancer free. So that was miraculous because they, some, somebody said, they've never tried this form of chemo on this before, but it worked. Um, and then I had to wait. Uh, you know, I thought I was out of the woods and, and so on. And I had to wait another four years. So then is when I had to continue to do all of my healing modalities to make sure that the liver didn't further deteriorate and I could, could function to some extent. Um, I mean, it gets to be a pretty ugly story because when you're ultimately ready for a transplant, um, they put you on the list. And that means, you know, you're, the likelihood of you dying in the next six months is is pretty darn high. About 30% of the people on the list actually do pass away waiting. Um, and so it was touch and go as to whether I'd make the cancer remission date, you know, before I'd get on the list and before my liver would shut down entirely. But I got there. We got there. And and did hope uh, did hope did did hope change and move during those four years? It must have been up and down. You must have days when you wondered if you were ever going to get through and survive. So um, I, I reconciled myself to whatever would happen. I guess I'd got, I had gotten into a state of mind of every day is important and I'm living every day. And so two things were at play for me then. One was this pathological optimism, which just never abandoned me, which was, you know, I can actually, maybe I can actually keep my liver healthy for the rest of my life, whatever that may be. Um, and, and the other was, you know, I am in control of this situation. There's a lot of things I can do to, um, to make that happen, right? So for me, it was, I just never kind of let down that after surrendering to whatever could happen. Then for me, it was just, every day at a time and being positive because that to me was the big um, magic recipe for everyone else around me to keep going as well. Let's talk a bit about that being positive. Uh, it is an interesting uh, element in activating something that we uh, tend to think is dismissive and that is the placebo effect. Uh, at least uh, 30, well about average 30 percent, but in some cases um, placebo effect is active and, and helpful in 80-90% depending on the condition and the one variable amongst all diseases that has been found which activates the placebo effect is not only the positive mindset of the patient but the positive mindset and compassionate delivery of information from the healthcare providers yeah. when there's that partnership of hearts it is activating something in the mind, body, spirit connection. And yet that in itself is only one level of the placebo effect. It only goes so far. There seems to be something else at play, which we might call a, a spiritual level or, a, well, a, a mysterious level of integration and engagement, which really unleashes the body's ability to endure far beyond what prognosis has is, is been given. Mm -hmm. You endured for four years, yeah, and then your transplant day came. Yeah, and then you, yeah. you can get one. Yeah, not like the game, not like the deal is over at that point either. So I get the call about the transplant, um, and actually I get the call that I'm on the list, which is like Yahoo, we're on the list. And it was the dry spell that year; there were no livers available, so. It was another five months after that call that I was finally called to say there is a liver available. And um, I already also been told I was a really bad candidate for surgery uh, because of the state of my arteries and veins and so on, internal organs, uh, as a result of chemo. And so, I mean, I don't know why they told me that, but I didn't believe it. <laughs> so. But, but it was true. What happened was I had the surgery. It was 19 hours. It was supposed to be six to seven or eight hours, but it was 19, and that was because I hemorrhaged a lot during it. They started recycling my own blood even because they'd run out of you know other people's to give me. So that was a bit of a brutal experience. Of course, not for me, mostly for my husband and loved ones who were waiting anxiously. So I got out of that, felt like I'd been hit by a truck, and 
Um, and yet I was a bit of a poster child for quick recovery from, you know, a grueling transplant. I was back up on my feet the next day, well, two days maybe, um, and all set and ready to go home. About three weeks, I guess, was the recovery cycle. And I was packing my bags literally to go home. And then I passed out uh, in the bathroom, to be exact. And I don't remember anything after that, except what had happened was I had hemorrhaged and lost the liver. Yeah. So they, they kept me in an induced coma and told my husband we had 48 hours. Uh, and if a liver, another liver wasn't found, that I would I would be gone. Make other well, let's say the name of your book once again because it's no exaggeration. One <laughs> woman's inspiring triumph over a series of terminal diagnoses. It's called Back to Life. <laughs> you had to receive another liver. I did. Yeah, and the odds of that happening, I, I can't. I mean, I can't emphasize enough. It took us. It, it had been seven months, uh, the, the last round, when no livers are available in Vancouver, BC at all. And um, it was a dry spell. So to get a liver in 48 hours, what they do in that situation when you're in crisis is the doctors have to make a judgment call, right? They, they have to decide, A, is this person worth it? B, you know, is there a chance? And, and C, then do we put out the call? to North America or near vicinities to find a liver wherever it may surface and, and bring it in. And thank God they made the call um, and, and, and we found one. Uh, and, and then I had my second transplant, which was another 21 hours of grueling hemorrhaging and blah, blah, blah. So um, I, can't, I, I can only tell you that I do know um, from talking to the doctors afterwards, and I've had the privilege of introducing Dr. Scudamore, who helped me through this at uh, Liver Foundation Dinner recently, and I went back to see him and get to know him a bit after the fact. And he said, you know, a lot of this was um, making the decision about somebody who we thought would make positive use of of the liver and, and had such a positive attitude that they would have an impact on others and carry on with their life purpose. And you are wired for that. You had done all the homework and preparation that brought you into that situation in the optimal state, not only to receive the second liver, but to be assessed as someone who would, would be a great candidate. Yeah, exactly. It was a judgment call and they made it in my favor and I'm forever appreciative and uh, and glad I did what I did to make them like me or, you know, and it is that, that point that you made about uh, doctors just having a predisposition, heart-based partnership to get through this together. And that's, that's what I benefited from. But then it was um, another year after that before I was, I would say, back to normal, back to life. And did you put on a pair of sandals and go to the beach? <laughs> Ultimately, I did. That's the cover photo on my book. My, my uh, daughter and I uh, went to Bali and climbed mountains together, so um, symbolically and otherwise. So, no, I'm, I'm enjoying every moment now. It's, it's been a pretty unbelievable ride. And touch wood, I think that the book is written. <laughs> the book is written. The book is available on Amazon and Chapters and online, and, and you can have a look at that. It's going to be packed with a lot more details than we've chatted about. I'm curious, Kathy, if that positive optimism has continued in the well, year. Well, it it did it has. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm still made that way, thank goodness. But I did go through a really rocky aftermath from the second transplant, and I guess they subsequently were in the middle of it diagnosed it as post traumatic stress disorder, um, which is not unusual although the surgeons don't really tell you much about that, um, but I want people to know that it's not unusual um, and it's something you can actually do something about. I went to my GP ultimately completely um, distraught. I, I mean, I couldn't function. I would, my husband and kids would leave for the day and I would be at home trying to work from home, which is where my, you know, my practice is now. Um, and I would be in tears most of the day, just thinking about 
I don't know, the bleakness of everything and how I, how much I'd lost. I think I was dwelling on the loss of, you know, I wasn't feeling as healthy as I used to. It's getting older. My kids were leaving home. You know, we were, my husband and I were like, we're, we're getting old and you know, our finances weren't what they were because I wasn't working for a while. And, you know, all this bad stuff. I was looking at the cup being less than half full. No. Um, it, it's, it's a, just to mention to our to our viewers, post traumatic stress uh, means the emotional homework, which is massive when you're facing a life threatening disease, let alone uh, two or three. Um, mm -hmm. That emotional homework builds up and isn't processed; doesn't come really to the surface until after you're through the crisis. And friends and family may be confused; they may be congratulating you, saying, "Well done," and let's get back to normal life, and you just don't feel it. That's right. Right. So you That's found yourself. I, like monster. I couldn't even tell them about it because people were saying exactly that. Oh, congratulations. You must feel great. And I was, what inside I was going, no, I really don't want to be here. <laughs> you can't say that to anybody. I couldn't even tell my husband. Right. I, I went, I finally told the GP, thank goodness. And she did the right, the right things for me. Yeah. So that emotional homework, which is coming out through tears, lack of engagement in life, not feeling vitality, limited range of emotion, sleeping a lot, overeating, uh, again, more maladaptive uh, coping strategies. Mm -hmm. It's temporary and you're able to work with it. What did you and your GP come up with as strategies to get through that? Well, she sent me to a psychiatrist and of course he um, initially prescribed antidepressants and I took them for about two weeks and realized it wasn't helping for me. It wasn't the right thing or something. But the best thing that uh, they did is that they referred me to a, a therapy group. And when I connected with those people, um, I guess it just really brought brought my heart into the equation. Um, the pe people around that circle were in varying stages of serious, serious depression, um, chronic um, re repetitive, you know, suicidal. And then we all told our story around the circle. And the first time I went, I was the last person because they always have the newbie go last. And when I told my story, at the end of it, their faces lit up. They were just so inspired by what I had been through that I, I mean, I, I should have felt like an imposter, but I felt like, oh my gosh, I can, I can actually give some value here. So I kept coming back because it was just so gratifying for me to be able to give them some sort of inspiration and some hope. Um, because I was talking as well about the depression, not just the whole illness. And, and so they, they saw me as one of them, but somebody who'd conquered a, a lot. Um, so that was very, very therapeutic. I guess it was the whole idea of not turning inward, but turning externally and helping others. And yet in, it, it was in practicing that compassion and inspiration for others that you were able to connect with it for yourself. It was reanimated within you. As yes, you gave it away. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, how many years? How many years ago was that? So that was in two thousand and nine, and here we are in two thousand and sixteen. So it's been seven years, based almost seven years that I've been in in good health. Well, you know, don't count the year after the transplant because I actually had to get back to even being able to walk, you know, care for myself. But when I came home from the second transplant. I've been in the hospital so long that my, my muscles had atrophied, so I needed 24-7 care. So I don't count that year. So let's say it's been six years that I've been back to normal, if the, the new normal. Um, I'm playing tennis four or five times a week. I can, I don't run it as much anymore, but I still can if I want to. Um, it's harder on your body than tennis. <laughs> so. it, it does sound like you have experienced a resurrection of sorts. So. Um, you had to rebuild from the foundation, yeah. And uh, you, what that did was bring so many new things uh, into this new stage of life, this new normal. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Yeah, for me, I'm actually in a perfect place now. It couldn't be better. I, I love the work I do. I have a great boss. That's me. <laughs> I work for myself. So I left. You know, I. I've been through the telecom business and then I went to executive search for four years and now I'm uh, on my own as an independent consultant. 
probably should have done this a long time ago because I recognize now that I don't respond well. It's me. It's about me. It's not about the culture of the workplace. It's about me and how I respond to competitive, you know, driven, intense environments. I'm better working as a consultant with them, understanding what balance looks like than I ever was working in them being unbalanced. And your website? Is www.kmclaughlin.com. And on that website, you'll see a wonderful video. Uh, I think uh, you're, you're presenting to an audience at a conference, and you do tell the story about your toenails and, uh, and being able to wear a nice pair of shoes. And it's really a great, great talk. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, there is so much more to explore, but I want to leave that to our viewers. Uh, you can find it in Kathy's book. Again, the name of that book, Back to Life. One Woman's Inspiring Triumph Over a Series of Terminal Diagnoses. Um, really fantastic chatting with you. Is there anything that you, you'd like to say before we, we wrap up? Um, uh, no, I just, well, I guess there's one thing I want to say, and I've done a lot of work on this. I do speaking in the workplace now on work-life balance and how to bring positive um, attitude to conquer almost anything. And to me, it's important that people know that it's a muscle. Optimism is a muscle that can be developed. I was blessed with a certain amount of it from birth and just by my upbringing and so on. But people who are not that way can actually develop it. So they don't have to be defeatist about the fact that, well, I'm a pessimist or I'm not an optimist. They can be. It's a choice. And that, that, it's, that is more than, than simply mental. Um, it requires, that positive thinking requires an investment in more than your thinking. An investment of your heart, your consciousness. Absolutely. True, deep belief in the goodness of life and that life has more gifts for you and that you can bring more gifts to the world. You, uh, you certainly did that uh, with that support group. You brought them with your family, I'm sure, life life went through these huge transformations and changes in career. Yeah. But you were brought back to them. Yes. Yeah. Just fantastic. Thank you. So usually at the uh, the beginning of our podcast, we start with a, a, a quiet reflection. I wanted to wait until the end of the podcast because we gather so much wisdom. We, we, we get inspired by our guests. And now we may be filled with a sense of gratitude or wonder or, or, or just a sense of, I want some of that. <laughs> so uh, we're going to end with a, a brief meditation, a brief, uh, quiet connection to those gifts which are in each one of us. So if our viewers can um, work, uh, take a moment and feel your body sitting in your chair and take a, take a little time of silence. And I'd like you to listen to the sounds in the room that are there with you right now as you're watching this podcast. Now that may include the sound of my voice, but include the sound of traffic. You have children in the house making noise, it includes them. And drink in these sounds. Let your breath go down into your belly few deep breaths. And if you can name maybe two or three things that you've heard in this podcast, inspiration, gratitude, triumph, hope, I'd like you to feel these things shining out of you, out of your heart. I want you to send triumph and hope, endurance. Send these from your heart. Send them to your family. Your loved ones. Instead of grasping for them or hoping that they would be there for us, 
we're owning them right now and we're sending them out from our abundance. Whatever struggles in health, whatever diagnosis of cancer you're facing, I want you to send from the fullness of an abundant heart these gifts to others that you are craving to have yourself. Deep breath. Renee, thank you for tuning in and watching this interview today. And Kathy, thanks so much for chatting with us. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. Really amazing. And I wish you smooth journey ahead. No more bumps. Well, they always come, but no more big bumps. Well, I'm just grateful for the bumps I had, and I'm looking forward to the rest. <laughs> Whatever comes. That's fantastic. So once again, have a look at the uh, the book, Back to Life, One Woman's Inspiring Triumph Over a Series of Terminal Diagnosis. I'm David McGinley for the Healing Cancer Foundation. Thanks so much for joining us, and we wish you a really blessed day.